Hello everyone, it's Paola and today I am interviewing the incredible, the one and only Kayla Ancrum. She is the author of Darling, which inspired my glittery makeup today. Hi Kayla, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us what Darling is about? Certainly, and thank you for having me. So um, I, the, Darling is my third book. So I am a author junior at this point. I'm really, really interested in writing about teenagers that are diverse and clever and, you know, passionate about whatever it is that they're doing. So um, with Darling, I kind of wanted to continue my, um, my track record with that. Um, Darling is a Peter Pan reboot. It is an adaption that is set in modern times and set in Chicago because that's where I live. <laughs> I don't know that much. It follows Wendy who meets Peter Pan when he's breaking into her house and he's super hot and super cool and he invites her to a warehouse party which of course is very glamorous for her um, and she decides to go with him. And it's about how Tinkerbell, the Lost Boys, and all of the characters from Peter Pan that you know and love um, are playing the exact same roles they played in the book, but everything is just superimposed on modern times. It is a thriller, a very intense thriller. I would highly recommend uh, checking my uh, content mornings on my website when you're looking up Darling. So if you are somebody who likes dark and spooky, high octane thrillers, Darling might be the book for you. I'm so excited. I'm so excited for this book to be out in the world and for more readers to experience the grandness of your writing. So what inspired Darling besides the obvious Peter Pan story? So I actually plotted out Darling a long time ago in 2013 um, when I was significantly more active on the Tumblr uh, platform. I had just finished The Wicker King and was roughly halfway through writing The Way to the Stars, my second book, um, when I was given a copy of the original book. And I hadn't read it since I was a kid and I hadn't seen the Disney movie relatively recently either. So I was starting fresh, brand new with this, with this book. And it was a lot different than I remembered. Peter Pan is a book that is designed in a way that only one other book that I know of has managed to capture since. Um, and that book is Coraline by Neil Gaiman. It is a book that is designed to be read one way by children and another way by adults. Um, a lot of adults find Coraline just incomprehensibly terrifying, whereas kids are like, it's an adventure story, <laughs> having a good time, she's gonna win. Same thing with Peter Pan. It is a adventure story about a bunch of kids, you know, going to a new world, meeting this fantastical character, battling, you know, pirates and having this, you know, experience where they are the adults within their experience and eventually making their way home safe and sound. To an adult, there are a lot of things about Peter and Peter Pan that are written to be immediately identifiable as problems. The one that is the most interesting to me and is the reason why I decided to write, darling, is that Peter Pan is a serial killer. In the beginning of the book, the characters are told that Peter Pan has like lost boys with him in Neverland, but we are never told that they are also immortal like Peter. What we are told is that when they get to be a certain age, Peter thins the group out is he kills them. The, the lost boys live until be about maybe 12 or 13 and then he kills them. The second time they mention it um, is when they're talking about Peter having like memory loss issues. And they're just like, oh, Peter Pan will like wander away from the lost boys group for a little while and then he'll come back and be really disoriented. And then you have to go and find the body. Like that is actually text in the original book. So like I was reading this and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> but I was like, okay, I'm going to write a book. It is a modern book that is given to readers in the same way where you're reading it and you're Wendy. So you're experiencing the adventure, but because you are not within that circumstance and you're not a child since it's young adult fiction, you are subtly aware of the things that are happening around them, like all of the, the characters, that something is really, really, really wrong. So that's why I wrote Darling. That is mind blowing. And I love that you started drafting it and coming up with it when you were much more active on Tumblr, because I know from your Twitter that you were uh, an avid user of Tumblr and a fan fiction reader and writer. And I think you tweeted recently that sometimes like people say that things read like bad fan fiction. What is a bad fan fiction? Why can it be just bad 
fiction. Uh, fan fiction is really interesting. Well, first things first, there are authors who write fan fiction. So like there's there's like a broader quality. It's almost like a self-publishing novels. There, There's a vast difference between the lowest quality novel that you can get and the lowest quality fan fiction you can get because there's no like editing. And then like, there's also no copywriters um, for it. So it's sometimes there'll be typos or, you know, misspellings, but like, you know, it's pretty rare with the really, really fancy ones. But one of the things about fan fiction that makes people say, oh, this work feels like a fan fiction is the self-indulgence of it. Fan fiction is an art form that is designed with love for other people out of love. You love something so much that you decide to write about it and other people are reading your work because they love it so much that they wanna give you their time and their attention. So there's this like integral aspect to it that is a self-satisfaction kind of story. So when people are like, oh, this feels like fan fiction, it's almost like they're saying too many things are things that I like. It is too easy for me to consume this work. It is too, you know, simple and satisfying. And the ending was too well resolved. Like I'm not, you know, this doesn't, and I'm just like, oh, but that's the stuff that's good. Like we love that stuff. That's why you, you wouldn't know to compare it to fan fiction if you didn't read enough fan fiction for me to be able to point at you and say, you like it. <laughs> so, yeah, it's something that I love. On um, Tumblr was a different kind of environment though. It was a completely a little, almost like TikTok, but just text form. I actually formatted my first two books um, in Tumblr format because I wrote them on Tumblr. So when I was plotting this book, I was kind of like within a community that was familiar with, you know, like textual, I guess, writing stuff. So I had the environment to kind of pitch certain concepts to them. And I came up with an idea that was both really satisfying emotionally, but also just like as dark and thrillery as I wanted it to be. I adore that because that the case for fan fiction lies exactly there. It's just funny because a lot of people hate on fan fiction because they don't know it, but also like retellings are kind of fan fiction. You put your own spin in it. And I just think that's genius. Beyond this world, Kayla is way too smart for all of us people. So appreciate her. Uh, back to Darling though. Uh, what are some of the themes that you knew you wanted to explore from the beginning and which ones kind of snuck up on you? I really wanted to explore what it means to be brand new to a city. I wanted to write about somebody who's from the suburbs, doesn't know things about city, like you know, big dense American cities. Um, with like a pretty decent understanding of like their cell phones, ride shares, Ubers and whatever and stuff like that. But still through the circumstances winds up being trapped because of their newness. And then um, what it means to find a boy that's attractive and then find a boy that's like a, a boy. And the way that Peter acts with Wendy and the way that this guy acts with Wendy are like polar opposites of examples of the way that boys can be in young adult fiction. And there's an aspect of being an author that I think authors really talk about. And that's that we are educators as well. We're kind of similar to teachers. Um, and we have to be responsible about the kind of content that we create for our readers. Um, so I actually do take a lot of consideration about the portrayals of different types of people within my books, because I know that children are reading them and they are learning certain things about them. And they, in some cases, may be taking guidelines from them about how to act in their own life. So I think it's my responsibility if I'm going to write a book with a, you know, heterosexual main, main character and try to design, you know, an environment that both palatable and appealing to girls, but also healthy and idealistic for girls. So um, one of the things that I wanted to, themes that I wanted to do was what is appropriate in a relationship? What is appropriate in regards to, you know, physical contact with someone that you just meet, um, respecting your, you know, needs and wants in your space, um, how gently somebody should be able to take care of you in a circumstance where they can clearly tell that you are out of your depth and uncomfortable. And then I also wanted to focus a little bit on Peter's immortality. The thing that snuck up on me, the magic. I write contemporary fiction. I am completely honest in my, you know, I'm not that great at world building. I'm not that great at describing all the stuff that's going around me, but I am very good at dialogue and I'm very good at using dialogue to create the reality of space when there is very little description. What I wanted for this book to be was a contemporary book that felt like a fantasy. Oh my God, that's so interesting. I love your mind. What is this book's theme song? So I have ADHD. 
So um, I do this this type of stimming where I will listen to the same song over and over and over and over and over again <laughs> until I have soaked every bit of joy out of the song. And the song that I did that with for this book is a song by the band Hot Chip called The Warning. And it's one of those songs where the music and the beat of it is so like upbeat and like poppy and you know happy and stuff, but the lyrics are like really threatening and like dark and stuff. And I thought that that was such a good you know, metaphor for this book that it's so magical and whatever, but it's also like incredibly dark when you like actually take the time to stop and look at what's going on. So this is the rapid fire part of it. And it's just a couple of questions. You just have to say if you're one or the other, or if you prefer one of the other. Flutter or a pantser? Flutter. Paperback or hardback? Paperback. Yes. A book you want <laughs> everyone to read? The Little Prince. Should books be judged by their covers? No. <laughs> but I think when you're trying to decide what, what kind of book you want or whatever, you can kind of like tell how much work has gone into like making sure that the quality of the content is decent by the cover, especially when you're looking at like self-published books. It's a little bit harder that way. What's your purpose in life? Have fun. I am a joy seeker. If you could write a retelling of any other story or fairy tale, which one would it be and why? It's <sighs> a good one. Recently, I've been saying Frankenstein. I'm super into the concept that Dr. Frankenstein made the monster hot for no reason and, and then spends the rest of the book talking about how he's ugly, but like you've made him hot. Like he found the hot parts and put them together to make a hot guy. And now he's like, I don't like him. Like, I, I'm of the opinion that the monster was actually still hot and that he was just uncomfortable with the concept of that. And that like everybody was just really freaked out because he made the monster too tall. Because like he found tall guy parts and put them together to make an even taller guy. And the reaction everybody has is always immediate shock and like just horror, but not really disgust, I guess. And I thought that I've always thought that was really funny. And I thought that it would be really funny to write like a novella, like a shorter book about that. I am in. I am in. 100%. <laughs> I remember, I thought you were going to say uh, this one, because I remember you wrote a small thread on how you would love to write uh, Susan Pevensey, who gets into like STEM. I, I don't oh, remember that. Yes. I it's forgot about that. I literally spend the entire year of last year during the pandemic just coming up with book ideas and just being like, I can write this, I can write that. But um, I wrote a Twitter thread about Susan using science to get back into Narnia. Because if any of you are like fans of the Narnia series, The Magician's Nephew is a book about a about a scientist who uses science to get into Narnia. So we know that that works. And the idea of Susan being kind of like blocked from Narnia via traditional channels by Aslan because, you know, he's, I don't, I don't like the Susan does lipstick and whatever, but her getting to be so smart that she can break into Narnia by herself. Very cool to me. Concept is amazing. I am so into that. With that in mind, tell us about your upcoming project. Oh, you actually caught me at a really good time of the year. I um, I have a book coming out uh, maybe early next year, late this year with, it's called Lethal Lit. It's a podcast um, done by Scholastic about a, um, a young girl who solves mystery, solves a mystery with her friends. And it's like a, you know, deadly murder mystery. And they hired me to write a book for them. So I have that one coming up. Um, but more on like my own world because it is a train heist a girl gang train heist about this group of girls the leader of whom is dating a guy who has really bad epilepsy but he doesn't have that much money so they're trying to rob this train to get money to pay for his stuff and then they're all they have like different family things that they need to like pay for And they're robbing a Christmas train that actually exists that goes from Chicago to New York. And it's a luxury train. Tickets are like $3,000 to $7,000. It's all rich people on this train. And they're trying to rob it to steal at the petty cash boxes where people want to buy expensive drinks. They're not going to rob the passengers. They're just going to sneak on, steal the little petty cash and run off. And when they get onto the train, the train is already being robbed by adults. That is amazing. Ah, I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I, I literally just turned into my agent like last week. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Kayla, for being here and doing these with me. Thank you for having me. It was wonderful. Yeah. If you haven't already and you'd like to go ahead and hit subscribe and we'll see you in the next video. Bye. Bye.